quality right there. And your family is definitely blessed. Thank you so much, ladies, for sharing with us. And we are very grateful and honored to be a part of Pilar's whole festive experience here today. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Lord God, we thank you for your presence. And as we briefly share, or at least attempt to briefly share, on prayer today, it is my prayer that you will lead, that your Holy Spirit will guide, and that we will say only what needs to be said, and that we will feel and experience your presence. It's my prayer in your name. Amen. So years ago, I read a book by Charlie Shedd called The Exciting Church Where People Really Pray. I've forgotten pretty much most of the content of the book, with except for the story of a young man who was newly elected to the church board. At the church board where Charlie Shedd, the author, was the pastor, the young man asked a very simple question. What do you think God wants this church to be? From that question came a second one. What would happen if every one in our congregation was to be prayed for by someone else in the congregation. Charlie said that that night, those questions from this young man stopped the entire board in its tracks. The rest of the book is the answer to that question. And what a question it is. We all believe in prayer, don't we? Okay, so there's about six or seven of us. How about the rest of you? See, if you work with me here, if I know that you're with me, I'm editing the sermon on the fly so that we can go home early. If you don't work with me, then I feel like you're wanting to hear everything that I put in here. And I have a track record of giving you your time's worth <laughs> and then some. All right. What would it do to our worship if everybody in our congregation prayed, if everyone in our congregation knew that they were prayed over? What would it do to our worship if you knew that you were lifted up in prayer today? You knew it. This morning, I woke up with a need to pray for somebody I hardly know, someone from South Congregation. I only met them twice that I'm aware of. But I woke up seeing their face. I woke up knowing their name. And I kept on ignoring it until I came and sat down here and I've already prayed for that person twice. And eventually, I had to text that person to say, I, I just want you to know you've been prayed over. I, the whole morning, I felt like you needed prayer. I don't know what the person's situation is. I don't know if it's my overactive imagination. But I really felt that this person needed prayer. But what would it do if you got a text message just letting you know today you were prayed over? What would it do to our preaching? if we knew that we were prayed over? What would it do to our congregation's ministries, our worship leaders, if we knew that we were prayed over daily? What would it do to our evangelism, to our outreach, to our vision, our mission? What would it do to our relationships with, well, everybody else? Our churches wouldn't be the same if we made sure that every person we prayed for every day that that blessing came down on them. So what would happen in our church if we prayed like that? Now hold that thought because I'm going to come back to that in just a little bit. 
But in the meantime, I want us to see what Paul had in mind. I want to read our, our scripture reading here. As you're looking there, um, I'm going to come back to what Paul says in just a little bit. He says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. As he nears the end of this magnificent letter, Paul reaches out and calls Christians to put on the whole armor of God so that we can fight and win the spiritual battles that we face every single day. Then without any break, in verse 18 he continues and says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Now, in the school of Christian thought, this is prayer 101. This is how you pray. This is the how-to, not the why of prayer. There's nothing difficult to understand here when it comes to the concept of prayer. And it's easy to see how it fits within the context. Prayer is our ultimate weapon in spiritual warfare. It's not part of the armor. It is the weapon. That which makes the armor effective. And in verse 18, Paul gives five fundamental facts about Christian prayer that I think each and every one of us should understand. Number one, there are many different ways to pray. And they're all valid. You know, when I was growing up, I was told that this is how you pray. You put your hands together. You bow your head, you close your eyes. And if I did anything else, there was trouble. So to me, when I was in prayer at church and I peeked, I was surprised at how many sinners there were in church. Because they didn't pray like me. And I was told that this is how you pray. There were even adults that prayed with their eyes open. There were even some that were fidgeting with candy wrappers during prayer. Sinners. <laughs> Paul says we should pray with all kinds of prayers and requests, with all prayers and supplication. We can analyze prayer, well, from many angles. We can talk about the content of prayer, such as prayers of adoration, prayers of praise and thanksgiving, meditation, confession, prayers of petition, different kinds. We can talk about posture. Do we have to go on bended knees? And do we have to put our fingers together? And can your thumbs cross or can they just, you know, can, can, you fall, uh, can you sit and pray, stand and pray? Can you pray with hands lifted high? Well, we don't do that in the Adventist church, do we? Can we pray with our eyes open, eyes closed? Can we pray while walking in the mall? <gasps> How about praying when we're kneeling? How about praying when we're stretched out on the couch? How about falling prostrate down on the floor before God? We can talk about associations of prayer, which means we can pray alone. We can pray corporately together as a congregation. We can pray in small groups. You know, as Adventist pastors, we like to get together in groups of twos and threes whenever we go to meetings. We can pray during a concert. We can pray together on Google Hangouts, Skype, FaceTime. We can even send out prayers via email. A while back, I asked for prayer when we had some deaths in my family, and somebody actually typed up a prayer on my Facebook page. Huh. That was a first for me. A person prayed for me by sending me a prayer that I had to read out. 
But I was amazed to see how many other people were blessed by a Facebook prayer. So you can type up a prayer. You can send it via text. You can handwrite it. We can talk about the style of prayer. Prayer can be formal. Although, yeah, using words that Microsoft Office doesn't even understand anymore. Or it can be informal. Dad, it can be liturgical. It can be written, recited, conversational. It can be antiphonal, sentence prayers. Have you ever had popcorn prayer? I know a lot of people don't like popcorn prayer. Now you look lost. You don't know what a popcorn prayer is? I will do it here one day before they report me to the conference. I simply start off. You know what popcorn does when it pops? Pop, 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 pop. I start off and you just throw out one word prayer request. Or thanks. Parents, brothers, car, money, home. Pop, 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 pop. That's actually nice because you can get the whole congregation to say a prayer in less than a minute. If you're really fast. But they can be thank you prayers. Lord have mercy prayers. They can be short prayers. They can be long prayers. They can be prayers sung. They can be prayers spoken. Prayers written. Prayers chanted. That's one thing I haven't seen in the Adventist church yet. But when I was up at Andrews now, I had to go and attend mass at Notre Dame University as part of a research project. And there a prayer was chanted. Beautiful. But I think half of you would have the heebie-jeebies if we did it here. <laughs> prayers offered spontaneously or prayers memorized. And we can talk about places that we go to pray. You know, the Bible tells us, you know, find your, your inner room, close the door, be quiet. Jesus went and found himself a nice secluded little spot in the middle of nowhere. Some of us might, might want to sit down at the dinner table after a meal and just tarry a little bit and just have a prayer when everybody else has gone up and before your wife nags you to go and do the dishes, you just hang around. And luckily, I don't have that problem, but you know, just some of us. Right? But we can talk about the objects of prayer, such as confession, restoration, physical or spiritual or emotional healing, financial need, broken relationships, salvation, praying for spiritual growth, praying for the spread of the gospel, praying for a friend in need, leaders in our church, leaders in our government, for our friends and yes, even for our enemies. Prayers may be as varied as the needs of the heart, but the true measure of prayer is not its form not its content or style or location or length or beauty of expression. The real question when it comes to prayer is, does it come from the heart? Is it sincere? Are we truly seeking the Lord? That's why I love it when somebody can come up here and do the congregational prayer and just pray the way they talk. There's no trying to impress anybody. There's just an earnest communication with Jesus. Lord, please be with our congregation. Be with our country. Lord, heal those who are sick. Truly, please. You can hear them pleading. James 5, 16 tells us, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. But keep in mind that the language is the prayers of a righteous person. Have you confessed your sins before you prayed? Have you made yourself right with God? Or are you just simply wondering why your prayers are not being answered? You know, the best time to pray is when you feel the need to pray. That's simply it, right? If you feel the need to pray, pray. On all occasions, Scripture tells us. The Greek word here is kairos. It's a particular moment. It's when you come to a crossroads. When you feel the need for God, pray. 
It speaks of coming to that crossroads with a sense of our own weakness, knowing that something has to give one way or another, and we just say, Lord, please, right here, right now, direct me, help me, point me. Sometimes we approach prayer superstitiously. It's like we should only use prayer to pray about the big stuff. I'm not going to pray to God about a sandwich. It's a sandwich. But I am going to pray to God about this $100,000 student loans I got. But why would God be bothered with me praying about corn on the cob? Why would God be bothered about me not being able to find my keys? It's just keys. But how foolish are we? He's God. All stuff for him is small stuff. No matter how big we think they are, for God it is small stuff. So we are still bringing small stuff to God. Perhaps we should say it another way. Because he cares so much for us that even our small stuff matters to him. A few years back on Mother's Day, and this is one of the frustrations I have with living 9,000 miles away from home. Neither my brother nor I were in town for Mother's Day. But on the Monday after Mother's Day, my mother remarked via Skype that her Mother's Day was a fantastic day. She managed to hear from both her boys via Skype. She didn't care the methodology. She was missing her boys and the mere fact that she could hear from both her boys on her day just made her day. Nothing could be better than that. Well, I guess being there in person would be a little bit better. But that's all she wanted, is just to let her know that her boys love her and to hear it in our voices. Even although my mom is not happy with the fact that I'm acquiring an American accent, which I don't think, but yeah. When kids are in trouble and need their parents' help, we want them to call and to let us know. And it works exactly the same way with God. God just wants us to reach out and to say, Daddy, thanks. Daddy, please help. At least just recognize him. He waits to hear from his children. Because we are his children, he will never turn away. I used to tell my daughter, and I still do, no matter what you've done, I will always be there for you until the day life is taken from me. No matter what you do, as much as I hate it or am frustrated by that, I will always be here for you. I'm your daddy. That's how God is with us. But yet we like to categorize it. Oh, I've gone too far now. But I know what I've done, and my parents were always there for me. Even when they had to pick me up at a place where there were blue lights flashing. Not once did my dad say, now you've gone too far, get out. He should have, but he said, I'm your dad. Some years ago, the Sabbath school lesson was about the truth that God is always with us. And so the Sabbath school teacher asked the kids to draw a picture to resemble this concept. And she was going around looking at all the various pictures and then she saw this interesting picture of one boy. He drew a boy in bed with raindrops over his head and on the outside and a big monster with scary eyes peering in through the window. And she looked at this and she said, but where is God with you in this picture? And he said, he's here everywhere with me in the picture. 
He's with me in the bed. He's with me in the dark. He's with me when it storms and it rains. And he's with me even when I think I'm seeing monsters outside the window. Jesus is everywhere with me. We've all had moments like that when it's raining inside. When it just feels like we can't get out from the storm, that even when we try to find shelter, there's a storm in the shelter. There's a monster outside just looking at us. And nothing is going right. But God is with us even then. So go ahead and pray. God is near us when we need him most. Third point, effective prayer requires sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Paul says we are to pray in the Spirit. That basically means we need to pray under the influence of the Spirit. Let me finish that. It helps me to think about this way. Praying in the Spirit means following the Spirit's guidance as to when to pray. Because prayer itself is the language of heaven. The impulse to pray comes from the Holy Spirit. He not only invites us to pray, he also incites us to pray. Sometimes you'll think, you know, should I pray about that? Don't ever brush that thought away. Sort of like me and this gentleman this morning. I try to ignore it, like, you know, sometimes you wake up with a dream, you don't quite know what it, no. Pray for that person. Sometimes people may say, I wish we could pray about that. Take that as a message from the Holy Spirit that you should pray about it right now. These impulses to pray may come at any time. It may come at you while you're on your phone. It may come while you're talking to a friend, while you're listening to K-Love. I know you don't listen to anything else, maybe Spirit FM. <laughs> Even Magic 95, no, yeah. When we are sitting in church, when we are taking a deposition, when we are having sleepless nights, when we are getting ready for surgery, if you think about praying, go ahead and pray. This thing's giving way. Maybe, maybe we all need to pray about that too. Let me try and do some magic here. All right. I think this antenna is picking up some static that it shouldn't have. All right. The Holy Spirit knows our heart, and He intercedes for us sometimes. The Scripture tells us with groanings that cannot be explained. And sometimes, let's face it, when we have to pray, we don't have the words, and sometimes you are so choked up with tears and emotions that all you can get out is a groan. And the Holy Spirit will translate that. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See, he comes alongside us. When we pray that our feeble prayers rise with power and enter the courts of heaven because of his intercession for us. There's an old gospel song that used to say, I need uh, to have a little talk with Jesus. You know that song? The song continues, when you feel a little prayer wheel turning. Now, I don't quite know what that prayer wheel is. I've never really seen one. I've sung about it. But I kind of just get the idea that when that wheel is turning and you feel the need of prayer, pray. The Holy Spirit's got you. You can be sure that the Lord is turning the prayer wheel in your heart and moving you to pray. So let's not make prayer mysterious. None of us try to find out the mystery behind picking up a cell phone and calling someone else on a cell phone and there's no wires in between. We just know it works. So does prayer. Why do we have to try and analyze it? Whenever you feel an inner urge to pray, do it. 
Fourth point, if you want your prayers answered, stay awake and keep on praying. Reading verse 18 again of Ephesians 6. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. But Eugene Peterson goes further and says this way, keep your eyes open. Oh, this would have killed my mother. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. Think about the row that you're sitting in. Think about this congregation a year ago if you were here. How many faces are missing from who used to be here? Why? Have you reached out? No, I'm guilty of a lot of that. Paul uses military terms to get this point across. He says, consider a sentry guard guarding a base, if you will, in Afghanistan. Not far from a Taliban stronghold. Imagine that guard, standing guard. Now compare it to the guard working at Stonehill Target Shopping Center. Who will be more alert? The guard in Afghanistan or the guard at Target? I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping it'll be the sentry in Afghanistan. But the one who believes that he is on the front lines is going to be more alert. The problem with prayer is that we think we're the security guard at Target. We don't think it is that serious. And therefore, we are not that alert. When in reality, in our spiritual walk, we are in the middle of a great war in Afghanistan. There's a daily battle for our souls. Shouldn't we be more alert? He has to stay alert because his buddies are depending on him. But how many of our buddies in this very congregation depends on us? It's a life or death situation to them. And we mess around with prayer because we think it doesn't matter. When in reality, we are sentries standing guard on the front lines of spiritual combat. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to be distracted while you pray? Just as you bow your head, your phone rings or it vibrates, or your daughter comes over and says, Daddy, Daddy. Or some baby cries. Or your boss calls you in. Or suddenly you realize the bell just went off and your special K loaf for Sabbath potluck is about to get burned. A thousand things come crowding into your mind. Sometimes it seems as if the devil's best working time is the times when you are getting ready to pray. He unloads his full armory of distractions against us when we try to spend time with God. Or perhaps you decide to spend an hour in prayer and say, so you get on your knees and you begin to pray for yourself. You pray for your family members. You pray for all of your friends, all the members in church that you can think of, the leaders of your church, the missionaries you know are somewhere in a foreign country, all the missionaries all over the world that you don't even know about. Every country in the world, countries whose names you can't even pronounce. Finally, you pray by name for every person in every country of the world, or so it seems, and then you look at your clock and you discover of that hour-long prayer, you've only prayed for minutes and 30 seconds. Several years ago during a week of prayer, we had a Ask Pastor Eugene segment. After every night after I preached, we had this Ask the Pastor questions, and kids would submit questions, and I would try to answer it afterwards. And one of the questions that came out is, if God is up in heaven, why do we have to close our eyes and bow our heads down? Fantastic question. Why is it? We've all wondered about that from time to time, and here is the answer. You don't, and please tell my mother that too, you don't have to bow your head. 
when you pray. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to bow your head, close your eyes, and put all five fingers together when you pray. But we do it because we are so easily distracted. Because when you come up front here, I can see the movement of every single one of you in front of me. I can even see the blue glare of the cell phone on your shirts. So I know when you're listening to the sermon and when you're Facebooking it. And I've gone to check and there was no live streaming from Facebook, so I know you're doing something else. But it's okay. <laughs> this is a no judgment zone, as Tony likes to call it, right? <laughs> We're all here as God's children. But we close our eyes and bow our heads so that we can have intimate time with people. I find that I do my best praying when I'm driving long distances, actually. And for that, I have to keep my eyes open. Whatever helps you stay alert is the right way for you to pray. The fifth point. The wider our circle of concern, the wider the results. Paul instructs us to pray for all the saints. It means we need to pull ourselves out of the rut of praying only for our family members and ourselves. It is perfectly legitimate to pray for our family members, to pray for ourselves, to pray for our house. But you have not, not exhausted the power of prayer if you stop there. You have to go beyond that. If you pray for your friends, that's great, it's good. If you pray for your church, that is good too. If you pray for missionaries you know and love, that's even better. If you pray for other churches in your area, that's wonderful. And believe me when I tell you, the churches in the greater Austin area need your prayer. There's a lot going on. That's one of the downsides of being the area coordinator is you hear all the gossip from all the churches, including my own, because I have other pastors tell me that some of your members contacted my members and told me this is happening in your congregation. Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> We all need prayer. If you pray for God's work in other countries, your heart is stretched to new horizons. Think of your prayers in terms of concentric circles. Naturally, you start out small, you start your close, closest to your heart, and then you move out from there, and it grows with a ripple effect. With every outward circle, you move away from yourself and closer to the heart of God. For God so loved the world. How wide are your prayers? How broad is your concern? When you pray, pray for the people of God. And pray for those yet to be reached with the gospel. So for, just for our translators here, I'm going to be skipping some more, so you're going to be a little bit lost as I try to, to edit. Reading here from Ellen White, Signs of the Times, October 3, 1892. Take courage, talk courage rather to the church. Lift them up to God in prayer. Tell them that when they feel they have sinned and cannot pray, it is then the time to pray. The Father has given His Son for us. Through the Son, the Holy Spirit might come to us and lead us unto the Father. Through divine agency, we have the spirit of intercession whereby we may plead with God as a man pleadeth with his friend. Dr. Robertson says, the Christian secret weapon forged in the realms of glory. Prayer. Satan trembles, he says, when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Now, many of us know theology, but when I read scripture, what I'm trying to understand here is that I think more of us know neology. We need to spend a lot more time on our knees. That is where our personal prayers are sent to God and does wonders in the lives of those around us. So I'm going to give you two take-home truths to try and finish up here. Because otherwise you are going to start praying that I finish. And I'll be glad if you still pray, but let's... <laughs> First take-home truth. No one ever outgrows the need of prayer. 
most of us find it hard to say, pray for me. It's very difficult. I can hear when people call me up. They will talk about everything and anything and not say, I need you to pray for me. Until I eventually say, listen, is there something I can pray? Oh, pastor, yes. We don't want to admit that we're in need of prayer. We don't want to admit that the world has gotten the better of us. We don't want to admit that sometimes we've allowed Satan to just destroy us. We want to come across as strong in the faith. Here's the real truth about you and me. We aren't that strong. We aren't that smart. We are not that clever. We are not that wise or that brave. That's why we need others to pray for us. No one is so strong that he is beyond the need of prayer. No one is so rich in blessings that he does not need someone to pray for him or her. As the old spiritual says, it is me. It is me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Sometimes we do not ask for prayer because we are overly concerned about our image. I'm the pastor, for goodness sakes. I'm not going to tell the church, pray for me, I'm weak. Pray for me, I'm dealing with temptation. I'm the pastor. I've got it. I don't got it. I need prayer. Our pride keeps us silent even in desperate moments. Well, we want to keep up the image that we are in control, that we've got it together, that we can handle our problems, that we are self-sufficient. We are not. After all, people hear us asking for prayer. What will they think? If they love us, they will think that we are someone who needs prayer. And they will, in fact, pray for us. Who is the greatest Christian of all time? I would like to nominate the Apostle Paul. Who knew the gospel better? Not many. Who preached it more fearlessly? I don't think anybody preached better sermons than Paul. Dwight Nelson might give him a run, but he can only preach the way he does because he knows the writings of Paul. Yet, this man who wrote most of the New Testament, this man who was tortured, this man who went through more trials and tribulations than you and I combined will ever go through, he wanted the Ephesians to pray for him. He wanted his church to pray for him. Was Paul a failure? Not at all. As I mentioned, he wrote the greatest part of the New Testament and opened Europe to the gospel, yet he wasn't afraid to admit that he needed prayer. It's a mark of the right kind of humility when someone says, please, can you pray for me? A second point. No one ever outgrows the need to pray for others. Someone you know needs your prayers right now. In the army of the Lord, every soldier needs help. Someone needs hope. Someone needs patience. Courage, love, determination, insight, strength, guidance. Someone will, will be wounded unless you pray. Someone will give up unless you pray. Someone will be deceived unless you pray. Someone will heal to temptation unless you pray. Someone will make a foolish choice unless you pray. Someone will spiritually grow faint unless you pray. Someone will collapse under the load of pressure from this world unless you pray. Someone will go AWOL unless we pray. There's always more than enough to pray about. If only we would be opening our eyes to see what else, who else we can be praying for. So look around. Even during prayer, if you have to, Look around. I have picked up the needs of people by looking and seeing who are shedding tears during prayer that have kept the tears from falling when everybody else was looking around. But when they are vulnerable before God, they couldn't but shed tears. I saw it and I could reach out to them. And I'm not asking you to all keep your eyes open during prayer. Use common sense. But look around. 
Every one of us is fighting a battle that we're not aware of. So let me return to the original question. What would happen in our churches if everyone in the congregation was prayed over every day? What would it do for our worship experience? What would it do for our outreach, for our relationships, our faith, our vision for the future, our leadership in Pflugerville community? If we all started praying for each other every day, we wouldn't be the same. Change would get a hold of us rapidly. I wonder if it could ever happen. I'm not thinking about another organization or some big program, some other meetings, reports that need to be filed. Those things are all good and well and they have their place. But that is not what is on my mind. Remember what Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Wouldn't that be wonderful if that was true of Stonehill? That we were in fact a church of prayer. That our members were known in the community for prayer. That people would send us emails, people that don't even attend here and say, could you guys pray for my family? Because they knew that miracles happen because Stonehill prays together. Think of the love that would grow, lives that would be changed, miracles that God would do in our midst. Think of the excitements of Sabbath mornings to know that you can come to church, to a praying church, to a church family, a church where you belong, a church that speaks your language. We would get up early and come to church eagerly waiting to see what God has installed for us today. We would sing with new gusto. We would be praying with fervency. And we would listen with new expectations. And who knows? Someone might just hang around long enough to get to meet and surrender to their Lord and Savior. Think of the impact around the world as we began to begin to pray for God's work and His people right here in Flugerville, down to Austin, spreading out Waco and above. Let's go as far as Egypt, Darfur, Tunisia, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Uganda. All the countries that we represent here today. If my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We are worried and we are frustrated as to what is happening in our country. But isn't it maybe time that we repent and see God's face rather than argue politics on Facebook? If my people, if, I think God has more for us than we have ever dreamed. What would happen if God's people prayed? Some sermon answers questions. This one asks a question. What if? What if God's people prayed? Now it's your time to think about it. May God bless you as you prayerfully consider the answer to what if.